This is the Courier 13 podcast with Warner Andrews. My goal with the show is to present conversations among filmmakers that impart knowledge and inspiration to people who are currently making content, or to those who aspire to make movies and television but don't have the know-how to start, or to people who are just fascinated by the filmmaking process and the entertainment industry. My guest today is film and television writer and director Daniel Willis. Okay. Hey, Daniel, what's up? Hi, how's it going? Hey, man, what are you up to right now? I am just kind of chilling right now. It's Saturday. I'm in Dallas. I'm working on a television show that's been shut down by the snow. Um, so we're, we're hopefully getting started on Monday. So right now I'm just kind of taking it easy a little bit. Oh, okay, cool, cool. You're, so you're in Dallas. We're, we're working on a TV show right now. Yes. Uh, I know Texas is having an energy crisis. Is that, I'm sure that has to do with, with, with the weather emergency. For sure, for sure. It's been really bad down here. People have it really tough. I've been very fortunate myself. Um, we did have to stop shooting um, last week. So we haven't um, been in production and I, I, I wasn't actually shooting yet. I, I'm prepping my episode, which... Uh, was to start on Friday, but now we'll start sometime in the future. Um, but yeah, it's been kind of rough. We lost power here at the hotel for a while, but that is nothing compared to um, what people have been dealing with. I don't know if you've seen the images, but it's been really, really crazy. Uh, I, I've not, I mean, I, I've heard that, it, that it's very bad and that uh, things are not being handled the best that they could be. For sure. I mean, they don't have, I mean, it, it doesn't seem that they have the infrastructure that, of course, a cold weather state would have. Um, but right. still, it feels like they were just kind of woefully unprepared in terms of, you know, what happens in an emergency. I mean, I feel like still, you you know, this is probably like a, like a once in every, you know, 40, 50 year kind of storm. But I feel like they should have been better prepared than what they were. Um, so hopefully the, the recovery isn't, isn't as bad as it looks like it's going to be. Yeah. 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 You always wonder like when, with places with like better climates, cause I mean, if this happened in Chicago, this would be, you know what I mean? Like yeah. we, we would be prepared, but if you're, if you're somewhere like in California or Texas or someplace mm -hmm. like that, do they even think that cold weather <laughs> is ever going to be an issue? Did you even, does that even cross people's minds? It should. It should, and it's going to cost a lot more to not be prepared and, and kind of rebuild than it would have to just be prepared and not need it, you know? Right, right. Yeah, well, that, that kind of goes into, well, what, what I want to talk to you about, like, because you, as far as, you know, television goes, you, you, you've, you've had your hands in, in, different, in, in different facets because you've been a writer, you've been a story editor for shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and you direct so i guess right now so with, with this show that you're doing right now I, are you at liberty to say what the show is and, and what yeah it's a brand new show it's called cruel summer it's going to be on freeform and hulu i believe um uh, later this year um so yeah i'm down here i'm directing for this show um two episodes okay great great what's, it, is, what's the show about um, I mean, that's, that gets kind of complicated. Basically, <laughs> uh, it's kind of like a period kind of teen drama set in the 1990s. Um, each episode covers like the summer uh, of, of three consecutive uh, years. Uh, and we kind of follow these characters uh, that are involved in this kind of crazy event uh, that happens over that time period. So every episode you'll see a little bit of the summer of 1993, 1994, 1995. So that's kind of, I feel like oh, that's, that's as much as I can say without uh, getting into a dangerous territory. I think. Yeah, no, no, that's, that, that gives me a good picture. I mean, I, I like, I personally, I, I dig shows like that. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I dig, I dig period pieces. So with this show that you're doing right now, you're, you're in a directorial position here. Yes, that's right. So what, because you obviously you have so much experience with this, whether it comes to the, the blacklist, your work on Grey's Anatomy and, and those and those television shows. And, and this show sounds a little different than mm -hmm. than those kind of shows on broadcast. Do you. I guess because I think so many people would be interested and I'm always interested to hear like 
when when people who are in this in this arena talk about it what is it like to direct an episode of television i mean it's it's really fun um what, what's different about it is you're coming into a space that's already established unless you are working on a pilot um so you know on a show like Grey's anatomy i came in and did my first episode there i think in season 15 so that you know it's a it's a you know a a story and a world and, a, and characters that are, are already well known to the audience. So your job as a director is to kind of come in and add a perspective on the particular story of that episode, which is new. Um, so that's kind of the challenge. It's like coming in and, you know, kind of dealing with all of these elements that have been established, but also try to bring a little kind of, kind of flavor or kind of texture or perspective point of view. Um, and so that's the challenge coming in. And, and that's what I really like about it. Um, also, it's like you're coming into an established crew. It's like you're not picking all of the elements. You're just coming mm -hmm. in and you're, you're making dinner in someone else's kitchen is, is something people uh, often say. It's like you come in and it's like these are the tools that are available to me. I'm going to bring in my particular skill set uh, and use everything that, that is at my disposal to make a meal. Uh, that everyone will hopefully enjoy. So uh, yeah. that's kind of how I look at it. That's the kind of fun challenge of it. Uh, and that's different than some of the work I've done um, in like short films, for instance, where it's like you're creating every element um, in real time, you know? Um, mm -hmm. This one, it's like you are combining with different collaborators to kind of build upon something that already exists. Right. And because that's interesting because what I guess what I kind of I guess the only thing I would I would ask you is do you find it difficult to uh, because you have this background of making short films and coming from a place where you assemble and you are the full creator of the project do you find it when like when you're on set or when you're trying to establish shots or create a shot list or, or you know you try to you know do stuff do you find yourself wanting to do things your own way and then having to stop yourself and be like, oh, wait, no, 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 I can't shoot it like this or I can't invoke this, these elements because that's not what the show is that I'm coming. No, to. I mean, because that's what prep is for. Um, so, I mean, I feel like a, a good television director uh, understands what the show is before they step on the set or even step in the office for prep. So if it's a show that, you know, is very kind of stylized and clean, I wouldn't come in and say, oh, I want to do some handheld shots. You know what I mean? It's like you, it's a big part of of it is understanding what the show wants to accomplish and then like playing in that sandbox. Uh, so I feel like a good way to keep yourself frustrated is to try to do things on shows that don't do those things, you know? Um, so for me, it's been really simple. It's like, okay, I understand what kind of what what the kind of visual style of the blacklist is. Uh, so when I come and work on the blacklist, I say, okay, given this is the visual style, it's like, okay, what can I add to here? Or, you know, what what kind of seasoning can I put into this? What what kind of creativity can I bring uh, within the world of, of what they do? Yeah. So for me, it it, it really hasn't. Um, been much of a challenge at all. It's just, it's, I feel like what makes that more interesting is like, you can't do everything. So it's like, okay, well, if you can do, you know, 10 things and not 50 things, it's like, how do you make something creative with your kind of more limited palette? And, and, and you, and you find yourself stimulated by that challenge. That, that, that challenge excites you. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I just enjoy directing. It's like, right. To me, it's like, you know, do you enjoy the work? It's like, do you enjoy working with actors? Do you enjoy blocking scenes? Do you enjoy, you know, creating business? Um, do you enjoy setting up shots and all these things? Um, it's like, I'm offered the opportunity to kind of do that at a high level. So I'm, I'm always excited to take on any challenge, really. No, that, 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 that's amazing. And you, because you, the shows that you've directed specifically on the blacklist, because I'm actually, I'm, I am a fan of the blacklist. Like I've watched, yeah, like I, I've watched, I remember, I, I mean, I think I've watched all of the shows. I kind of dipped off a little bit, but then I kind of came back and learning about you and learning that the shows you've directed, you did, you actually did some like consequential shows 
<laughs> in the series, like the one with uh, in I mean, in season seven, the one that revolved around uh, Katrina uh, Rostova. Yes, if, if I'm if I'm saying her name correctly, I, if I say <laughs> it incorrectly, I apologize. Um, like that episode, and as someone who's followed the show, like that, like that is a that's a pivotal episode. So my question is like, do you have to like meet? especially with the show that's or, or an episode that's so pivotal and fans have such a, you know, longing to know more about that part of the story. Do you have to meet with like the showrunner and do like you guys go in depth of like how it has to go and like how, like, does, does, are, is there a lot of supervision there? I guess no, is my question. No, no, no. I mean, I haven't had that be a part of my experience at all. My first ever episode of television uh, was on the blacklist. Uh, it was a season six episode, and I kind of expected, you know, something like what you're describing. It wasn't like that at all. I mean, really, um, just kind of come in. Um, I feel like there's a, a measure of trust that's extended to people who are completely new uh, to the show. Um, but I, the expectation is that you know what the show is. Um, I don't know if everyone does this, but I watched a hundred episodes of the blacklist before I directed my first blacklist. Uh, I wasn't a long time watcher of the show. I was. So you binged it. You were exactly. like, when you got the job, you were like, okay, now I got to spend so much time binging this. I mean, before I got the job, I actually shadowed on that show too, which is a big part of the process we can talk about as well. Yeah. Um, but when I got the opportunity to shadow, I said, okay, this could turn into an opportunity to direct the show. And I want to be an expert on the show. I don't want anybody to have to explain to me who Katarina Rostova is or what the relationship between Red and Elizabeth is or mm -hmm. uh, who these people are and what they want. I was like, I want to know that. I want to be the, the person that the actor comes to and say, okay, well, why am I doing this thing? I was like, well, because in season four, you did that thing right. and that connects to this. Uh, I don't always have that at the very top of my memory. Um, oftentimes you have to kind of rely on the writers or the script supervisors or whoever. Um, is at your disposal, but I want to be as prepared and as knowledgeable about the show as possible so I don't have to rely on someone to tell me why we need to block a scene a certain way or why a character has to play a scene a certain way. I want to I want to know those things. No, yeah. Yeah, well, because that that, 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 that that ties into my next question, which is like, so... That's crazy to me too. I did not expect that to be the case. That she that like no one would be like, okay, this is how from season this to this to this. But but they expect you to know that. They expect for you for that not to have to be explained to you. Yeah. Especially since feel, you shadowed on it. Yeah. And I mean, it's like <laughs> it's hard to to understand. It's like it's a big job, you know. So there are there are lots of high expectations for everyone. If someone were to come in and they didn't know why the characters were doing that. I feel like that's unfathomable. You know what I mean? Right. So I think I think there's kind of a you know a professional level of of expectation on anyone who comes through that door. Um, that's just a part of the job. It's like you got to know the show. You got to know why people are doing the things that they're doing. So how 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 did you get um, that job and and how would you how i mean how do most direct how how do most directors get shows on tv uh, like or um have that opportunity to direct i mean everyone comes to it differently of course um i would say the 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 most common way is for you know a person or a director a person like me to have um you know a, a sample your this is your kind of Proof like a, like a reel, like a reel. I feel like reels are are one thing. I'm not big big on reels. I, more like you know a short film or independent feature or yeah. independent pilot, something like that, so that you can show it to people. This is the proof that you're able to kind of tell a story in an interesting way. And so a big part of that is just getting it in front of the right people, be it a executive at a studio or a network or be it a showrunner or, you know, a producer or someone like that um, to kind of, you know, introduce yourself to the community as a director. And then, you know, you go through a, a series of, you know, meetings, you know, first general meetings with, you know, executive types or writer types, showrunner types. 
Um, and this is your opportunity to show your interest in the show, to show your knowledge about the show, your desire to direct the show. I mean, this is another reason why people aren't worried about, you know, directors coming in and not being prepared is because a lot of times you meet with the showrunner beforehand and you say, I love The Blacklist for these reasons. This is my favorite episode of The Blacklist. The, this is the character relationship uh, mm -hmm. that's really important to me. So you put folks at ease so the showrunner doesn't have to worry about you not understanding their show or not knowing what, 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 or they don't have to worry about you not knowing, you know, the kind of key plot points or things like that, because you've impressed upon them that this is, um, you know, a, a story, a franchise, a show uh, that you're interested in and, and that you're knowledgeable about. Okay. So from the get go, you are presenting to them your knowledge of the show you're 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 calming them you're setting them at ease like it's okay i know you're like your baby i got you i understand what it is and this is why it matters to me exactly exactly i mean think of it like uh kind of any you know job interview or uh kind of professional meeting that you could have it's like you know you want people to understand that you are going to be a good steward of what they of what they created yeah um that that is not how i expected it to go but that makes but that makes perfect sense that puts less uh that, that that puts less stress on them to feel the need to explain it to every director that comes on because there's so many directors especially for a show like uh blacklist and uh gray's anatomy and shows that you've worked on like there are so many directors just coming in and out of that show those shows like they just like they don't have time to like be pressing upon do you know this stuff like just show me that you know it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah do you what was it so so you you shadowed a director to get on the blacklist and that was like your first tv gig how did you go about securing that or like figuring that out was it just like you knew someone and they introduced you to that into that that director on the show and then well, you had a relationship with them? A bit. I'll back it up a little bit. My first actual um shadowing opportunity came from Grey's Anatomy. I was a production assistant, a PA on Grey's Anatomy. That's where I kind of got my first job. And separate from kind of my professional work, I was making things on the side. So I was making short films, I was writing pilots, uh, I was you know producing little music videos on the weekends. And yeah, I saw those. They're dope. I saw oh, them on your website. <laughs> um, and so eventually uh, I made an independent pilot with some folks I, I went to school at DePaul with. Um, that became um, uh, kind of my primary sample as a director. Uh, we did a bunch of film festivals and so on and so forth. It, it was a successful piece in that respect. Um, but then I had a sample. Then I had a piece of work that I could present to folks and say, hey, I'm a director. This is the work that I've done. Um, this is what I'm trying to do in this business. So I went to the producers of Grey's Anatomy. I was like, hey, I made this thing, you know, might you want to watch it? And, and one of them did. And that created an opportunity for me to shadow on that show. So it's like, okay, mm. we see you can do this. Let's have you kind of look at some professional directors um, and, you know, experience the show in that capacity. And if that goes well, then you know we'll hire you to direct an episode. So that was the case for Grey's Anatomy. That was also the case uh, for Blacklist. I also participated in fellowships. You, another good reason to have a sample is so that you can apply to you know network fellowships um, where you know you get the opportunity, if selected, to shadow on shows uh, that they oversee and potentially create opportunities uh, for professional employment from that way. So usually the kind of track is to, you know, create something that, you know, you feel comfortable enough to share. Um, if that thing is, you know, to the liking of the powers that be, then you can, you know, be hired to, you know, shadow or to direct, and then you try to build a career um, from that. That's a very concise way of, of, of throwing all that down. Um, I'd like to talk about the, the fellowship, because you were a part of the 2017 Sony Pictures Fellowship, directorial fellowship. Um, how did that help you out? Uh, aside from giving you an opportunity to, to shadow, um, how, did, how did that, how did you, I mean, how would you say, how would you rate that experience? 
it was great. It was fantastic. Many of these these um, fellowships are, are similar. Um, it's like, you know, hundreds of people apply, they pick who they pick. Uh, you get all of these opportunities for professional development. You get to meet executives, you get to um, showrunners, you get, you know, directors coming in and talking about their experiences um, as well. And then, you know, if there's an opportunity, all, all of these, you know, um, programs don't offer shadowing opportunities, unfortunately, um, but Sony does. Um, so that's how I got the opportunity to shadow on the blacklist. So it's like, you know, you get all of this kind of almost like a classroom component, uh, a networking component, and then hopefully there's a shadowing component as well. And then those things kind of work together, you know, hopefully if you work it right, if you kind of are the right fit for the people that you need, if they're impressed by your work, so on and so forth, that can turn into actual jobs. That's not always the case. Um, you know, a lot of folks, you know, do these programs and then don't get their first jobs for years after that. Some people get jobs out of the programs directly. Um, so it all depends. I got my first job outside of the program and then I did the program and got additional work. Um, so everyone kind of comes to it differently, uses it differently. I think the, the, what I tell people is if you have the opportunity to apply to one of these programs, definitely do it, but look at it more as a lottery because they're extremely competitive. They're very difficult to get into. And once you get in, there's no guarantee of any kind of professional success after it. Um, but it is one of those things that you can pursue to kind of push your career forward. Mm -hmm. No, it's, that's, that, 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 that's good for people to know, especially people coming out of film school because I know there's, there's a lot of talk about fellowships and, and their, um, their use, but also you got to know what you're getting yourself into. And that, you know, I think people need to judge whether that's the right path for you, for them. Certainly was the right path, or it seemed to work out the right path for you. Did, um, do you remember the directors that you shadowed for on like the Blacklist? Absolutely. I shadowed Bethany Rooney who's a fantastic um, director. She's done, I think, multiple hundred episodes of television. Um, and she's uh, written a, a fantastic, or co-wrote a fantastic book on directing uh, called The Directors Tell the Story, which I, I always recommend uh, to folks. And she was great to, to shadow because, you know, she really made me a part of the process. So she would do her work and then come back to Video Village and say, okay, you saw how I did it. How would you do it? And I would have to tell her, okay, I would have done it this way. And she would say, well, okay, that's pretty good. But, you know, if you do it that way, then you have to think about this and you have to think about this. And if you don't do it this way, then you could run into this issue. So in that way, she was a great teacher of mine. Uh, Debbie Allen uh, is someone I, I shadowed on Grey's Anatomy. Um, this um, Norwegian director, uh, Cecilia Mosley is another person I directed, Paris Barclay. Uh, former uh, president of the DGA, I had an opportunity to, to shadow as well. And then when I was a PA on Grey's Anatomy for not, I was an assistant at Grey, Grey's Anatomy. I did several jobs there. <clears throat> um, but I always looked at that opportunity as informally shadowing every director who came through there. So I would go to set before I had to record to work and just watch then. And then I would go to set after uh, my work was done and just watch then and try to take in as much as possible from every director who would come through the show over a given season. So for me, it was about like taking every opportunity I could to kind of soak in as much as possible. Knowing everything that you know now and having learned from your past experiences from the directors that you've shadowed, what is your favorite part of directing and, and what's the part that you kind of dread if, the, if there is if there is any well I would say my favorite part has always been working with actors uh, I really enjoy I really enjoy that part just in general um, I like communicating with them I like talking to them about story I like talking to them about what their characters are doing um, so that's my absolute favorite part um, but I also like collaborating with the camera team and my DP and 
um, just kind of building, you know, our storytelling visually as well. Um, so there's so many things that I like about it. It's hard to choose one, but I, if I had to choose, it's that kind of director actor relationship uh, and fostering and creating a, a performance, which is the most important thing to me. No, I, I, I would, I would totally agree with you. I mean, from my personal experience of directing, I would, I would agree with you on that being able to work with your actors and communicating the best to them is, is like a very fun challenge and you have to do it a lot to learn it. I think to learn how to do that best. Um, directing aside, because obviously you have a lot of directing work, but you're also a writer. You've also written on many shows. You've helped out on many shows in that capacity. What, what's the, what's the difference there, I guess, from being a director and a writer on a show, because those are two very different things. Like I say, Writing on in television, unless you're a showrunner, so I'm talking about 99% of people writing on television, it's about being a part of a team. Um, so it's about um, understanding, you know, what the show is that you've been hired to work on um, and kind of taking the direction and guidance from the head writer um, and then being additive and contributing to pushing the story forward. Um, working with your fellow writers in the room um, to build on what they're contributing and bringing your own, you know, new ideas and perspective to kind of work together to create something together. Um, it's super collaborative. It's a lot of fun. Um, directing, I feel like, you know, the key element is leadership, right? So it's like, okay, it's my job to tell this story. All right. So I've been presented with this script. Um, these are, this is what the show is. Um, so it's my job to kind of lead the ship in the telling of this story, to combine all the talents and abilities of every department head, um, to, to create a vision for the show and to execute that vision. Um, so directing, I feel, is just a greater responsibility, right? It's like, you know, everyone is looking at you for what you're going to do next. It's like, okay, it's like, you know. Well, you, you always that. have to have an answer to everything. You have to have an answer. And you're constantly questioned uh, about what you're doing and what, what you're going to be doing. Uh, for, for a writer, it's, it's a little bit different in that it's like everyone's not looking at you. You know, you're part of a group of folks who are expected to kind of create a script uh, and present it to the team to produce. Um, so I like both. Uh, I like, you know, being the captain of the ship. I also like just being a crew member uh, and just doing my part, whether that be, you know, maybe you're the person who's pitching the jokes or maybe you're the person who is keeping track of like the big story arts. Maybe you're the person who's really good at dialogue or maybe you're the person who's really good at character relationships. So, you know, finding a place for yourself in every room that you're in and being an addition um, in that capacity um, is a big part of television writing and directing. I feel like it's about, you know, leading the team as you execute the vision of the showrunner. Yeah. Which, because you've, you've worked for a few shows, you work with Boomerang, 20s, and, you know, several shows. Um, and I'm sure you've wor you work with the showrunners of, of those shows directly. Um, what have you learned? Because I'm always curious on how the showrunners work with their writers. What have you learned from, you know, because when you're in the writer's position, you're like, you're not the leader, you're a crew member. But have there been showrunners that you've worked with who have taught you stuff about leadership and how to run a writer's room? Yeah, I mean, both of the, the showrunners I've worked with are uh, three of them, uh, actually. Um, I feel like it's about, like, knowing what you want and also like listening to your collaborators. It's a, it's a big like kind of dance between those two things because ultimately, you know, you can sit in a room all day and talk, but eventually, you know, you have to choose a direction. It's like, are we gonna go this way or we're we gonna go that way? So I feel like really good showrunners are decisive. And it's like, okay, I've heard everything. Let's go in this direction and, and, you know, kind of lead the team in that direction. But also I think they listen to the smart people that they hired, right? So it's like, if people are saying, oh, well, you know, it'd be great if we tried this, or it'd be nice if this character did this, or what if this is happening? I feel like really great 
showrunners take all the good ideas, um, but they also filter the, the, the ideas and they also kind of select, you know, you know, a particular kind of trajectory for the room. Um, so when I am a showrunner, hopefully one of these days, um, I feel like I want to take on those things. I want to like hire really good people and listen to them. Um, but, you know, be the kind of kind of lead writer, showrunner type um, that knows where they want to go, that understands what the show is um, and kind of forges in a direction, accepting the help of their writers along the way. Yeah, that's that, that that's great advice, because, I mean, I, I've always heard it um, said that the the showrunner has to have the capacity to be so headstrong on what the show is and what they want like the things that they really want and then you but you also have to i don't know disassociate from your ego sometimes and say well you have these really awesome people around you telling you these great ideas like you know what you have to evaluate like maybe i am wrong maybe my idea that i thought of right away isn't the best idea and well i think and i think that takes humility on some sure. level i mean i feel like you know if you want to be the kind of artist that goes unquestioned then you need to write novels you know and even then you know you're going to have an editor you're going to have a publisher you know um you know maybe you want to be a painter maybe you want to be a photographer um but making films and making television um is very collaborative there's always someone uh, who has an opinion or who has some kind of part in the process where you can't just have everything exactly the way that you want. You know, you never have enough time, you never have enough money, you never have enough resources. Um, so, you know, this kind of idea of like the singular genius who works alone and kind of pumps out all the work all by themselves doesn't really exist. Um, so I think like working in these mediums is like continually, continually uh, checking your ego and humbling yourself and recognizing that you you aren't the only person in the room or the smartest person in the room. I've been very lucky. I've worked with very kind of benevolent uh, leadership, very kind of smart leadership, and I've learned a lot from them um, that I feel like has helped me uh, to this point and will help me going forward, um, just constantly reminding myself that this is a collaborative art form a lot of really smart, interesting, dope people come together to make this stuff. Um, and you have to really honor that part of the process. It, and I, it seems to me that that's the difference between film and television. Not that film and tele, not that like on a movie set that you, you know, shouldn't be collaborative and compromise. Like I don't recommend that a film director be a tyrant, but it feels like coming, kind of going back to what you're saying with like even directing for like broadcast, like you have to take what you have and make the most artistic thing out of it. And the same can be applied to a showrunner when a showrunner has a specific budget, there's specific parameters that the network will allow them to work in. While of course a showrunner has more ability to decide and create, there still is a like, okay, well you have to create with what you have. We have mm -hmm. this let's let's do let's do something really dope and really awesome with this whereas i think feel like with films a lot especially if you're like you know you have a high budget there seems to be this mantra of just like whatever the director says we do that like you know well, that's a myth um i think <laughs> it, it's yeah I, that's, I that's why i use the word like mantra it's like it's an idea but i don't think it really works you i know? feel like culturally it's different like like television has always i feel like been a writer's medium uh, film has always been a director's medium um but the constraints on whoever the head of the leadership is are always the same whether you're working for a studio or a network on television or whether you're working for a studio or independent studio or production company in film it's still the same constraints there's still this amount of time and this amount of money you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it's like ultimately that's kind of the arbiter of what's possible, I feel like, um, for people to put on the screen. So yeah, culturally, I feel like everyone is deferential to the director primarily on the film side. And then I think everyone's deferential to the writer 
um, or in television, but still, it's like, you still can't have everything that you want uh, just because it's a movie and not a television show because, you know, you can't create more money and you can't create more time. Well, that, that is definitely true on time. You, you cannot create more time on, on a film set. And I mean, you, you know that as well because you, you've directed shorts and you've directed music videos and you've directed films. Um, like, what's for you, like, what's the difference? Like, what's the difference between directing a film and directing a television ultimately? I feel like the, ultimately the big difference is your ability to start from scratch in film. Like that's the, that's the thing. Um, it's not so much even budgets. I mean, like take your favorite broadcast television show that has a higher budget than most of the indie films at Sundance. You know what I mean? One episode of an ABC show has a higher budget than most of the kind of indef independent features that you see in some of the studio features, especially low budget horror features. You take a movie like Get Out, I think it was maybe two or three million dollars for that film. Yeah, yeah. An episode, Crazy of, an episode of Grey's Anatomy costs way more than two or three million dollars. You know, how much so does an episode of Grey's? How much? How much did the episode of your Grey show cost? Do you know that? Your average network drama has a budget, I think, five to seven million dollars per episode. Wow. So it's not, you know, it's not always about raw kind of numbers in terms of budget. Um, but what you get to do in film, which is really special, is just create every element. So the only, I feel like, opportunity that you have for that um, in television is the pilot, the first episode of any show. Right. Um, that's your opportunity to really kind of, like, create from scratch. And so I feel like that is, um, that's where I feel like most television directors ultimately want to be. It's like, you know, have the opportunity to create a show. Um, and the great thing about that is it goes on for a long time. It's like you, you create the first episode or you direct the first episode of The Wire, one of the great shows of all time, and that continues for years to come, mm -hmm. you know, what you were able to put on that screen. So I think that's really special too. Uh, so that's the only real difference I put between film and television is in, in television, you, you, if you're not a pilot director, you're given like a, a set of ingredients and then you move forward with that. Um, in film, you have a little bit more kind of control over those kind of foundational ingredients, but not complete control. Because if you're working on a studio feature, you know, you don't get to necessarily choose all the actors who are going to be in there. The studio has opinions about the actors. Sure. You know, you can't always choose, you know, um, particular kind of creative things because it, if you work on a Marvel movie, by the time you come into the Marvel movie, so much of the movie is done already in pre viz that what you're doing is adding your perspective to elements that already exist. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah. it's like, it's more complicated than even I expected. I never expected necessarily to work in television because I had some, a lot of the ideas that you're articulating, but then it's like when you get into the spaces and you see how, you know, I worked at a studio, I understand to some degree how studio features come together. So I, okay, that's more complicated than I thought. It's not just one guy sitting in a room saying, I want this, 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 and this, and this. It's, you know, one person saying, this is my vision and like choosing from uh, options that are available to them. So it's, uh, it's more complicated than, than even I expected for sure. Just so many questions that I want to ask you. Um, <laughs> we like, might need to do a part two because I only have a few minutes left. How about I ask you just one more question and then you can get going. Um, when you're directing a film, when you're directing a short, mm -hmm. because I, I just, and I, I think I'm asking this question kind of selfishly because I, I'm finishing up a short. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, do you approach short films differently than features? I haven't done a feature. Well, officially, I haven't done a feature. Um, I don't think that I would. Um, I feel like, you know, the, the biggest difference between a, a feature and a short, I feel like, is 
is like length and commitment. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like um, you still want to tell the best possible story, um, whether it's eight minutes or if it's 80 minutes, you know? Um, so I think it's about using your resources the best that you can um, so that you can put as much kind of production value on the screen and also that your storytelling can be clear and concise. So no, I don't think there's a real difference. Um, not in the mechanics of making the movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're still talking to actors. You're still talking to a DP. You're still setting up shots. You're still getting locations. All of the mechanics are the same. That's one of the biggest things I learned from being, you know, uh, kind of an indie kind of amateur director to being a professional director. It's like, okay, you know, yes, there's more people around. Yes, there's more money involved. Um, yes, it, you know, it's going to, you know, be distributed in this particular way. Um, but the mechanics of making the film is still the same, you know, you know, you still have, you know, a script supervisor, you still have a, a DP, you still have, you know, all of these kind of key crew people who come together to actually do these particular tasks to complete uh, the filming of the show. So for me, I think it's really good to think about whatever project that you're doing in, in a similar way. Um, so you can kind of bring the same kind of seriousness to it, whether you're making your first short film or this is your kind of big project that you've been waiting to make for years and years. Okay. No, that's, that's a great answer. I, I don't want to keep you any more than I don't want you to like be late for your meeting. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, and hopefully we can, we can get together uh, and, and do a little bit more. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Daniel. It was a really, it was an honor to talk to you. Awesome. Thanks.